So we are all here to discuss uh, living forever. Are we here for a millisecond in time and then gone, or is there some possibility now to transcend that to achieve something that, if it's not immortal, is a very long term of mortality? And indeed, are we going to be the first generation to see that? Because some people predict that by 2050, this is going to be some form of reality. We've got Patricia McCormack. Um, she's an author, editor, and writer of many academic essays. Anders Sandberg, he's a futurist, transhumanist, and uh, author. Yanni is a best-selling novelist who's known for her uh, adult novels, her essays, her short stories. Uh, so we are going to uh, kick off, and I think Patricia has nobly volunteered to start, Fears of Mortality. Does our fear of death? prevent us from fully living? Yes, that's the end. That's all I have to <laughs> okay, say. Okay, bye. Um, yes, but also I'm a death advocate and a death activist and I am pro-death and I would happily like to see the species die and die out. I think we have destroyed enough other species. I think we had our chance. We fucked it up. I think that um, humans as they exist today and now are simply repeating the same anthropocentric destructive patterns and it's no good and so my big question as a response would be why are we scared of death what do we think is so valuable and precious and important about our own individuality that it has to keep going forever what kind of pathological hubris does that involve and what would happen if we decided to decelerate the human ownership of the earth and start to open up the world to the possibility of other organisms? We have seen the cessation of so many species at our hands. Why is it that we have such human exceptionalism for our own species? Is it really that valuable? Because I'm not seeing a lot of benefit. I'm not seeing, you know, people, many people, but also non-human organisms really jumping for joy at the idea of humans living forever. And I also think that on a very sort of intimate level, death is the one thing that we all have in common and it doesn't matter. Now, people might disagree with me. It doesn't matter how much money or how much knowledge you have. Right now, at this point, we're all going to die. Um, and that is the one thing that reduces us all to the fact that we are simply material beings. And for many people, especially people in pain or in people who don't want to live anymore, the ownership of their life is proven to them as a fallacy because they are made aware of the fact that under our current government, they don't own their death. And so I think we've got this macro idea on one side that I am pro-human extinction, and antinatalist, but on a much more intimate level, on our day-to-day -day living, we don't own our deaths, and that shows that we don't own our lives. And I think that in order to really understand a sense of agency, the ownership of death should be part of the ownership of our life. Wow. So, and as, um, there you have it. Our life isn't really particularly valuable. Um, why should we cherish this in an egotistical way? Why would you want to extend it? Mm. Uh, so I like to kind of agree uh, with the last part you said. I think we should own our deaths and totally disagree with the first part. <laughs> Otherwise, this would be a rather boring conversation. But we're going to have some interesting agreements and disagreement here. So I would start off by saying, right now, I feel my life worth living. It's really, really enjoyable. And you might argue that actually, Anders, the reason you feel that is really enjoyable is probably some settings of dopamine neurons in your brain. We can even list some of the genetic variants and some of the connections causing that. That doesn't change that I'm feeling really good right now. Uh, and most people, I think, feel good. Not all, everybody, and not always. And that is something we actually need to uh, handle. That is also why we should be able to own our lives and actually try to make them better. And I do think that on net, all living beings want to live. That is unfortunately or fortunately what we have evolved to do. The living beings that aimed at extinction, well, they didn't leave that many descendants. So for good and ill, we are the kind of stuff, the entire biosphere right now, that tries to keep on going. 
And that leads to the, the interesting thing that we are kind of the smartest part of the biosphere right now, which I completely admit doesn't mean we are that smart. We don't really know what we're doing, and we're messing up things in a, in a very bad way in a lot of ways. But we also are aware that we're messing things up, and we can try to change that. So my vision of the future would be, as some of you might have heard on the space panel, that we actually manage to get our act together, get off this planet and spread life, consciousness and intelligence across the universe. Now, if you're an antinatalist, this is absolute horror. There's going to be so many minds and some of them are going to be in pain and there's going to be a lot of it across the universe. At the same time, I do actually think that we should recognize that in the long run, of course, the entropy always wins. We're right now in this uh, in the beautiful spring of the universe. It's, it's just been around for 13 billion years. Stars are going to be shining in a trillion years. Then they're going to go out, but this, the universe is going to keep on going for about a Google years before essentially all forms of history ends when the last black hole evaporates. You might probably get lifelike things going on for at least 10 to the 36 years before this matter starts decaying. I think there is a potential for an enormously great future that has enormously positive value. And this is partially because I don't think the pain and the negative stuff outweighs the positive, or at least we can make sure that that is positive. Similarly, individually, yeah, I do think that uh, while I like my life, it's not super important, it doesn't uh, overrule all other considerations. And I'm aware that even though I want to have life extension and I'm signed up for cryonics, sooner or later I will end, either because I have an accident or because I change into something else. Again, sufficient life extension is equivalent to becoming something else. Even the Christian concept of going to heaven, when you start actually talking to a theologian about how it is in heaven, you realize that you don't have a body, you don't have any negative emotions. Actually, an awful lot of the, thing, lot of the things we normally say make us ourselves, are gone and replaced by some general bright light, which makes it sound like that's actually not me going to heaven even. This is usually why people don't like talking to theologians about the afterlife. So my argument would be, yes, we're mortal. Even if we manage to fix our genes and uh, back us up in cyberspace, so occasionally things will go wrong and entropy will always win. But I'm not going to kind of let entropy just win. I'm going to play hide and seek. I'm going to have rather fun with that. <laughs> 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 so, so Yoni, here, here we are sitting, having a lovely time sitting in this hall. Isn't it pleasant enough that we'd like to extend this moment potentially <laughs> forever, or is that a terrifying um, thought? <laughs> <laughs> I think if we started going for forever, we probably at some point wanted to end. <laughs> and that's kind of why I tend to agree more with what Patricia was saying, even though I might not celebrate death quite as much. But um, I, I would like to, to frame what I'm saying by first saying, we can't judge life and death unless we look at why we think we are here and what we are here for. And my perspective on this is that I think we are guardians of our planet. We are guardians of that little place on the Earth where we are born or live. We don't own it. We, we should respect it and actually leave it, if we do things right, we should leave it better off than when we got into the world. And there are so many different ways of doing that. That can be done, of course, through environmental protection or so. It can also be done sometimes by you inventing a great technology for maybe uh, degrading plastics or writing beautiful poetry or even just bringing up your kids in a good way. But with that in mind, if we are guardians of this planet, then eternal life is the last thing we should seek. We are, what, seven going on eight or nine billion people on this earth. And I know Sweden is quite vast and have empty for, you know, areas with forests where you can actually get lost. But even in my Denmark, you can't get lost. You, if you enter a forest and you, work, you walk for a few hours, you will get out on the other side. And then go to Bangladesh, where I worked for a while. And I have been pretty shocked that basically nowhere in the country except maybe in the northeastern corner towards Burma will you find any square meter that is not either inhabited or arable land. You just don't find wild nature anymore. I imagine if everyone in Bangladesh would go for eternal life, um, you would quickly have those forests in Sweden populated. And then I don't know if you yourself would anymore enjoy your eternal life. I don't think we want to have just human beings everywhere, because it comes back to what Patricia said, we already have ruined um, so many species on this planet, and 
we're talking about for the moment that there might not be bees in a few years and then there won't be flowers and there will not be very much life left to enjoy. I'd just like to thank Yanni Anders and Patricia for a really invigorating talk. It was bloody brilliant. <laughs>